uh, welcome everybody to um, uh, the uh, policy re research briefing by the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, my name is David Biglio. I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Research. Um, IPR is um, a um, an organization that spans the entire uh, breadth of Northwestern University. We're focused on many different topics regarding uh, social policy broadly. I'm delighted to have you here today. Uh, uh, we have three uh, fabulous panelists, all colleagues of mine at Northwestern and IPR in the School of Education and Social Policy. Um, uh, Diane whitmore Shandabat, Terry Sable, and Lincoln Grace Lansdale. Uh, you'll hear from them all in a moment. Um, um, before we get going, I'd like to uh, make a special, I'd like to express a special thanks to our sponsors of this event, uh, Congressman Bob Bowling, who I'd like to invite up in a moment, um, and his office in particular, Jordan Heyman and uh, Chelsea Caulfield, and Congressman Dan Rapinski, uh, and his, his office in particular, Jason Day, and uh, Jennifer Seckle. Um, I am very, very grateful to all, you all for um, uh, for your facilitation and helping us to bring um, uh, cutting edge research to Washington to inform the policy, policy discussion. Uh, Congressman Bob Dole is in his second term serving Illinois' 10th Congressional District. He's an alum of Northwestern University uh, in the Pellon School of Management. Um, uh, Congressman Dole has been a champion of federal research and development programs as well as universal access to all children to high quality education. He serves on the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, Congressman, would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I want to say that thank you so much for, for coming out and, and bringing and organizing such a great panel. Um, and I think it is important, again, both Western great institution, certainly one near and dear to my heart. Uh, but I do want to thank you for organizing today's briefing. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting one. The Institute for Policy Research, again, a nonpartisan Interdisciplinary Public Policy Research Institute. Um, and IPR's mission is to produce and distribute top quality social science research on significant public policy issues. I would argue when we talk about education, uh, it's the building blocks for everything that we want to do. Uh, so many of the problems that we face out there, education is going to be absolutely critical. So today we are joined by three faculty scholars with expertise on early childhood education. And they'll be sharing their research on the cost effectiveness and quality of our current preschool programs, as well as the opportunities to further and improve the lives of children and their parents through preschool. Uh, I, for one, strongly believe in child, early childhood education programs and that are critical uh, to setting our kids up for success in school, the economy, and ultimately all of our communities. Uh, I will tell you that this is the research that I've seen if a child's not reading at a grade level by third grade, they go on a completely different path. Uh, and so, again, our dollars in terms of how they're spent and how wisely they're spent, uh, again, I think is something that we're going to have to discuss a little bit today. We're going to hear more about. And I do think it's absolutely critical. Uh, in the omnibus bill, the 2016 omnibus bill, obviously we had um, Head Start funding the $9.1 billion and increase there, which I think again is critical. But I also think it's critical about how we're using those dollars and how we can stretch those dollars the furthest to have the biggest impact. Um, but thanks to our talented researchers, uh, Professor Schausenbach, Sable, and Chase Lindsdale, we know that not all early childhood education programs are created equal. So I look forward to hearing uh, about their findings. I'm unfortunate to have the student here. We will certainly get a report back uh, in terms of the findings. But I, again, I just want to thank IPR and I want to thank um, our panelists today for the research that you're all doing. Uh, and obviously, this group here are the ones that are interested in that, that type of policy and will be helping craft policy in the federal government and states. So thank you again for more questions. Thanks to all of you for the work that you're doing. And I certainly hope that you have some, some great questions for our panelists that uh, hopefully you won't stump them, but I hope you do. <laughs> Thanks again. So um, thank you very much, Congressman Gold. I really appreciate your uh, your remarks and uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I want to mention a couple of things before we get started. First of all, as I mentioned, um, you can visit us at ipr.northwestern.edu. You can send an email to us at ipr.northwestern.edu. So as long as you uh, 
know how to spell our university and our get our initials correct. Not to be confused with the Institute for Research on Poverty at University of Wisconsin Madison, which is also wonderful. But uh, make sure you get the P and the R in the right place if you want to uh, come for our research. Um, um, we are videotaping this event, so in the event that uh, you wish to, and it should be on our website uh, relatively soon. So uh, in the event you wish to roll the tape later on and see uh, uh, your uh, what what our panelists are saying, that would be great. Um, I'd also like to uh, remind you to take this moment to turn off your cell phone, please. Uh, there, since we are videotaping the event, we prefer not to memorialize your cell phone ring for uh, forever. Um, so, uh, Congressman Dole, uh, in his uh, uh, introduction, mentioned that what we know about uh, third graders who are starting to, or if you're not reading at grade level at third grade, it's unlikely that you're going to catch up. I'd like to uh, share some, uh, just a way, by way of introductory remark, share some information. This is the population of um, uh, 1.6 million uh, uh, kids in the state of Florida that, whom I've been studying over the last uh, decade and a half. Um, and this, uh, for those of you who can't see, this is showing you uh, the national, the, the uh, percentile ranking scores for in Florida students based on their kindergarten readiness. Uh, the blue line at the top is uh, are the kids who start kindergarten uh, ready for school, as defined through a number of different psychosocial as well as uh, early literacy and early numeracy um, measures that the state collects. Uh, the red line are the kids who don't start kindergarten ready for school. And what we see here is that basically there are parallel lines uh, from uh, throughout the kids who start kindergarten ready for school stay basically exactly the same, uh, held exactly the same relative position in comparison to those who didn't. Now, don't take this as evidence that schools don't do things. That's absolutely not true. Schools do a lot of things for all kids. And a lot of what we do at IPR and elsewhere is aimed at trying to figure out the ways to help our schools do the best job they possibly can. But what this is saying is that um, if we're starting thinking about this in seventh grade or eighth grade or tenth grade, we're really starting a lot uh, very late. This, uh, this shows very strongly, I think, evidence, uh, again, in a population level way, that, um, that this is based on kindergarten readiness. Moreover, um, here are third grader grade scores based on parental education. Uh, the data that I'm using match birth records with school records, so we know about parental education. And what you can see is, uh, whether mom is a high school dropout, high school graduate, some college or four-year college graduate, we see basically the same difference between uh, the third grade scores for kids who are ready to start school in kindergarten and kids who are not ready to start school in kindergarten. And keep that in mind when you look uh, seven years later in 10th grade, and it looks identical. So what this is saying here is that um, this is an issue that's relevant for across the socioeconomic spectrum. Uh, of course, there's a larger fraction of kids uh, towards the left of this who are not ready to start school than towards the right, but large fraction, large numbers of children of college graduate parents also are not. So this is one of the things I want to leave, have my esteemed colleagues spend all the time talking, but this is just a way of getting, getting the ball rolling as to how incredibly important their work is on this particular topic. So I'd like to now turn over the floor to my colleague, Diane Shantabak, who will talk about preschool quality. Uh, what do preschool quality and cost tell us about how to target it for a universal program? Thanks, Diane. Thanks, David. So I'm gonna do a brief review of the literature. So we're very fortunate in a space of pre-K that we, I mean, well, of course we don't have the definitive answer to these questions. We have a lot of extremely high quality research study. And so we're at a place where we can aggregate uh, all of the information that we have to try to see patterns and understand um, what's going on. So we've got different studies that are across different times, different places, different tweaks to the models, uh, and different populations that are served. Uh, so I can talk a little bit about the overarching conclusions from those, those studies. The first is that preschool can have extremely high payoff. The second is those high payoffs are very dependent on the quality of the program, of the preschool program. Most, quite importantly, not only does the quality of the program matter, but 
quality of what the child would be doing otherwise really matters. And so we call it a counterfactual. So what else the child would be doing and the quality of the preschool program are both extremely important. There's emerging evidence, um, although this I would say is less settled in the literature, that it seems to be important to either treat most of the children in a, um, in a community or even all of the children in the community. So this is going to help us think about whether we should be targeted or we should be universal. Um, the reason that it might be important to treat all of the kids, make sure all the kids are kindergarten ready when they enter kindergarten, is because it's going to reduce the variability between classrooms in kindergarten. And that changes what can be taught in the kindergarten classroom and puts the kids on a different trajectory in terms of uh, um, learning. Unfortunately, because it's important to blanket an entire community, this makes designing targeted programs a bit of a challenge, although I argue that we can overcome that challenge. So let me um, do a little bit, um, as we consider what it would look like to expand preschool access across uh, different dimensions, we want to think a little bit about who currently is getting preschool access and where they're getting preschool access. So this uh, chart that I have up here shows the landscape over the last 35 years um, and the percentage of children who are attending some sort of, of preschool, whether public or private. And importantly, I've broken this out by the socioeconomic status of the child. Uh, and the metric we use here is whether the mom has had any college or is a high school dropout. So we're looking at the top and at the bottom. Can you have to break for Yeah. I think All right. So. I've been, I haven't been on update, so <laughs> we'll take a quick break. Please, Tom and I. Um, I think he wants to explain my next slide. Dr. Kamini Levinsky is a PhD. Um, <laughs> Uh, Representative Dan Levinsky, uh, thank you very much for coming. As a Northwestern alumnus, uh, committed to all supporting all areas of science. Thank you all for, for being here, especially in ICR. For, thank all of you for, for coming out here. It's important that we have good research uh, when we're making public policy, because especially when we're talking about early childhood education, for a long time we've been trying to figure out what, what works best. And it makes sense that uh, you know, we really have to study this to understand it so that we are spending uh, precious money in the right way to try to get the results that, uh, that we're looking for. And we realize more and more how important early childhood education is. I also uh, know that this uh, research funded by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Education. So I always want to take the opportunity to, uh, to promote the research that the NSF and the DOE do, uh, and we, we need more of that in order to help better decision making, especially talking about human social science. I never have up an opportunity to, to promote NSF funding for social science development, because that's a lot of times is under, under attack, but uh, this is the type of research that it helps us fund. So I thank all of you for being here, and thank especially our uh, our panel for for being here, and making me especially proud as a an alum of uh, Northwestern University. Although now I'm thinking of these ones that go high today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, I would I apologize for interrupting, but uh, thank you for for being here and for the work that you do. Thanks again, uh, Congressman Lipinski, for your support and uh, for your service. Um, I'd like to give the podium back to Diane now. As the Congressman mentioned, this uh, is data is, uh, is from the National Center on Education Statistics. We would not be, it's true that we would not be able to do our research if we didn't have a strong foundation of data collection and support for, for research. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. So you can see here in this chart of the constant decline to uh, walking group, uh, <laughs> uh, there's not a large increase in the share of children attending preschool, but it's very different across the economic mm -hmm. It was a very intensive intervention, so therefore we can see that there's large change in the learning environment. It has very strong lifetime impacts. 
Professor Heckman calculated that for every dollar we spent as a public on this program, we received eight dollars in returns to society. That's a huge return we never see. Uh, we very rarely see uh, returns like that uh, in other in other aspects. So then we can turn to thinking about what uh, the research looks like on Head Start. There's a lot of research, again, you know, I'm sort of summarizing over five or six really quite excellent studies. What you can see here is uh, Head Start is less narrowly targeted, it uh, reaches up the socioeconomic status much longer than the period of preschool, which is extremely targeted. It's also slightly less uh, high quality than the period of preschool. So there's a large change in input, at least historically, but it's not as large as we saw in the very preschool program. So it's because it's not really targeted, it was a less intensive intervention, uh, there was still a substantial but smaller change in the learning effects. The evidence suggests there are positive lifetime impacts. They're smaller than the, uh, what we found in the uh, but nonetheless they're they're sizable. This is you know summarized in studies from Janet Curry at Princeton, Dave Deming at Harvard uh, and so on. So then if we want to think about um, what the landscape is today, um, I would argue that it looks something like this orange dotted line. So a lot of kids from the lowest SES uh, backgrounds are going to preschool. A lot of kids from high SES families are going to preschool. Those probably vary by the quality of preschool. And so we can uh, think that, you know, for example, uh, the Head Start Impact Study, which I think a lot of people in this room know something about, and we're pretty disappointed with the uh, with the findings. Well, I would argue that we can reconcile that with this, through this model that Head Start today is most likely to represent an improvement relative to the counterfactual because a lot of those kids that Head Start research has shown this had other preschool options and would have attended other preschool options if it weren't for Head Start. Um, so we can think about then, you know, we're all interested, or many of us are interested in expanding access to universal high quality uh, preschool programs. So I've drawn that along here, um, along the green line. So we can think about, compared to the counterfactual today, which is probably that orange line, we would expect to see modest, you know, moderately large improvements in skills, bringing low SES kids from, uh, you know, a moderate preschool environment or a no preschool environment to a high quality preschool environment. At the other end of the socioeconomic status, we might actually find that if families substitute from their private, high priced, high quality preschools into a universal public program, we might even see skills decline at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the income distribution. Of course, that's not to argue that families are made worse off by this, because if they switch from a private preschool into a public preschool, they got a lot more money in their pocket. And so they're still making rational decisions. So I would argue that what we see overall in the literature today is that high quality public programs for low SES kids improve their skills, not as much as we saw in Perry because the landscape has changed dramatically. So we're expecting a smaller payout. We're not going to get $8 for every dollar we spend today. Um, at the same time, if we think about high quality universal public programs for high SES students, um, what the research shows is that we see a lot of substitution. Families decide to forego that private preschool and put, go into the public preschool. Um, this may um, result in reduced skills, but um, an important thing that it does is it really drives up public costs. Right? So families are saving the money that they would have spent on preschool. And the public is paying for that instead. In fact, our results, um, by my own research results from Oklahoma and Georgia, find that four or five out of every 10 high SES kids who enrolled in the publicly funded preschool in those two states would have attended a different uh, private preschool instead. So this is basically just a, a money transfer to them. The families are better off because they've got less out of pocket to spend. Um, so again, the impact of preschools is going to depend on the quality of the counterfactual, the level of quality of that new public program, and the cost is going to depend on participation. And to the extent that we have high SES families substituting from private to public um, preschool programs, it's going to really drive up costs. So I would argue that the literature is broadly consistent with this framework. I'm going to just sort of skip through this briefly. I've highlighted some of the support. I'm happy to answer more questions about the literature. Um, during the Q&A time. But just to, to finish, we want to think about well, what does this mean for thinking about designing preschool programs 
do we want a targeted high quality preschool where we think the bang for the buck will be highest, like it was for Perry, like it's been for, for Head Start? Um, I, on this one hand, I would argue, yes, that's what we're looking for is targeted and high quality. But a caveat here is that we've got new, very high quality results from Tennessee, which are very disappointing. And it's, I think the whole research community is trying to uh, understand this. It's, of course, only one study, and we need more replication of this to figure out is this. And I think the state of the literature right now is it's either because the quality wasn't really as high as the it was in Tennessee, or it's because it was too targeted and there were too few kids with access. And as a result, uh, we didn't have that rising tide with all of the votes in the kindergarten classroom. And then things sort of fell apart in kindergarten because there was a large disparity in uh, kindergarten skills within classrooms. So one option would be targeted, but not too targeted, uh, high quality preschools. Uh, the other question here is really how to maximize the bank for the buck. And so we want to go for universal high quality programs like we've seen in Georgia and Oklahoma. Uh, we might we need to really carefully consider how much cost share we want to ask higher income families to do. They're happy to take the free lunch, but they probably also will really, because it's such a valuable, uh, valuable um, tool for their kids. They're probably willing to to pay uh, pay for it too. So very briefly, the takeaways are that preschool is very important. The literature, I think, it conclusively demonstrates that, but it's not a miracle cure. And there's strong research evidence that it is cost effective. The impact depends on the quality of the program, and that importantly depends on the quality of the counterfactual, that is, what the kids would be doing otherwise. And I think, based on the research, near universal attendance is probably the right policy goal, but free for all is probably not the right policy goal because high SES families should be willing to chip in for this for their kids. Thanks, Diane. Um, next up, uh, and on the topic of quality, is uh, uh, Terry Sable, uh, who is our uh, uh, associate at FDR and uh, assistant professor in the School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern. So, Terry. Thank you. So, I am going to pick up where um, Diane left off to think about once you've expanded preschool or at least increase access to preschool, how do we sort of think about structuring those, the, the activities that children actually participate in and make sure they actually are high quality? So preschool quality in some sense has been sort of a policy buzzword or research buzzword. So the U.S. Department of Education uh, recently came out with a report saying that we need to expand access to high quality early learning to ensure that all children graduate high school prepared to succeed in career and college and in some sense, it's quite bad. He's saying it's not just that we need to expand preschool, we can ensure that those preschool experiences are of high quality. In addition, there was a report that came out a couple of years ago where over 1,200 researchers signed a kind of document saying that the evidence based on preschool suggests the quality of preschool is a profitable investment. And this is based on decades of research, as I mentioned, that we really are sort of able to reach consensus that high quality preschool is a sound investment for young children. But if you're like me, I read these things, I start thinking, what exactly is high quality preschool? And how do we actually measure it and think about improving it? Uh, and so for the most part, the ways we've been defining high quality is in some sense, is the program producing outcomes for children? So this is very similar to the K-12 teacher value added model. So teachers are considered high quality teachers because they produce outcomes for children. But we can also sort of flip the switch and think about well, what is it that there are a particular element of those environments that are producing outcomes. So this graph uh, basically is actually summarizing a lot of what I spoke about, which is that we have a range of effectiveness of preschool programs. So the way I interpret this is if I look at, let's say, Boston pre K, where they have an effective 0.6, that translates to about six months worth of learning. So kids who show up in our so kids are performing in September, where they otherwise would have been performing in March or April. And so on the left hand side of that graph, we see these really big programs from the 1960s and 70s that were very effective and produced huge effects. And then as we sort of uh, scale up into um, programs that are either targeted or universal programs, uh, the effect sizes get slightly smaller but still are quite large. And then right on the right is Head Start from the Head Start Impact Study, uh, which shows that although Head Start had a, had a positive impact, it, it was a bit smaller than, than other studies. 
Uh, and so what's even more interesting is if we sort of unpack that Head Start impact study and look at the range of effectiveness of Head Start, it is true that sort of on average there was sort of a small but positive effect of Head Start. There was also a pretty big range in the, in the effectiveness of those programs. So there actually were some Head Start programs in that study that actually had a negative effect on children. But there also were some Head Start, some head start programs that actually had huge effects. And in some sense, if we want to sort of scale up preschool, we want to think about, well, what is it that those programs are doing on the right-hand side that's producing those effects, even among the same regulations that all other Head Start programs had to adhere to? And so trying to get under the hood in terms of thinking about what produces high quality, I think, is an important area for the <laughs> So one way we can think about uh, quality is thinking about the structural features of the classroom environment. So uh, I think anyone who might have a preschooler or, or a student uh, wants their child to go somewhere that where the program is, is safe and uh, is, uh, provides healthy uh, opportunities for the kids. Uh, in addition, we can think about class size and staff child ratio. Uh, as a teacher, you certainly don't want 100 children in your classroom, right? Uh, staff qualifications for level of learning, uh, education for teachers and directors as well as curriculum. And while all of these things are really important, at the end of the day, and what developmental science tells us from decades of research, is that the extent to which those things are effective in promoting learning is the ways in which they're implemented in the classroom. So those moment-to-moment -moment interactions that teachers are having with children are the primary ways in which children develop. So we might purchase the best curriculum in the world, but if, it is, if the teacher doesn't know how to implement it while in the classroom, then potentially it's just a pretty box sitting on a shelf. Or if we have really small class sizes, but teachers aren't doing individualized learning or teaching with those small class sizes, but again, it's not going to be as effective. So we have a number of policy levers and systems that think about how do we actually ensure that children are attending high quality preschool programs. So Head Start sets out a number of performance standards about what is high quality in terms of uh, things about structural aspects and some, some more sort of process oriented things. The pre-K programs typically say that, that teachers might need to have a bachelor's degree in order to teach in the pre-K programs. And then recently, which raised the top early learning challenge, there was quite a bit of funding that went forth for states to actually improve the way that they assess and improve quality, assess and monitor quality within their state. And the primary lever for that are these things called quality rating and improvement systems, which are the ways in which states say we've got a bunch of Head Start programs and pre-K programs and other child care programs how do we actually sort of put them all under the same system to make sure that parents know which programs are sort of higher quality versus others? So in these systems, states typically get together, uh, stakeholders in the state get together and say, these are the indicators of quality that matter. And for the most part, those are indicators of structural quality. Uh, and then to aggregate them together so a parent can say, oh, look, there's a five-star program across the street, and there's a one-star program, I'm going to send my child to the five-star program. Unfortunately, the rollout of these systems is far away from evidence, and we aren't really that close to figuring out how do we aggregate a bunch of measures of quality together to say this is a high quality program versus a low quality. So in work that we did, we conducted a simulation study where we actually replicated what states were doing in terms of these state quality rating systems to see if we could actually find any sort of relation between child outcomes uh, and the ways in which states were defining quality. And we purposely selected indicators of quality that were the most common that states were using, which were primarily focused on structural elements, so things like staff qualification and ratio of group size. We also focused on classroom environment, which was also an observational measure, uh, which included some things like what is the space and furnishing, but also some things about uh, the uh, language in the classroom. And then lastly, we added on another measure of teacher-child interactions, which is an observational tool where you can actually go in and observe what's happening between teachers. We purposely selected state-funded pre-K programs to say above and beyond what those thresholds are for, for structural quality, what would sort of the added benefit of regulating beyond these things. So we're not testing the effect of having 100 children for one teacher. We're saying above and beyond what states were, were testing for the added benefit. So basically, this graph is just showing each of those individual indicators of quality versus high versus low quality and whether they relate to children's learning. And what we find is that above and beyond what is already regulated in those pre-K programs, there was no added benefit of having additional levels of teacher education, nor was there an added benefit of, ratio, of increasing or decreasing the ratio of staff-child ratio um, or class environment. There was a small relationship between that and children's learning. 
And then we did find an association between uh, the extent to which teachers are using high quality teacher child interactions uh, to promote learning uh, and relations to children's peer reading skills and math skills. So the implications for this are that if I were to go into a classroom, I could focus on things that are sort of easily to check off. So I could focus on the teacher in that classroom and the number of children in that classroom. I can also focus on the materials in that classroom. Uh, so are there textiles, uh, curricular materials, how the classroom organized? But I can also try to get really in depth in using observational methods to try to understand what's happening between that teacher and that child. Is the child comfortable with the teacher? Is she asking questions? Are there open-ended questions? Is the classroom organized? Are all the children engaged? And this type of thinking really has wonderful implications for thinking about teacher training. So can we actually use tools that actually get at where the learning occurs to think about the ways in which we train teachers to ensure that they're having the highest quality interactions with, with children? So in sum, uh, I think this is an exciting time to thinking about investing in preschool uh, to ensure that all children are ready to, to succeed in K-12 uh, and beyond. But that we really need to move beyond to this checkbox approach in terms of thinking about quality. And this is actually good news. It means we've actually done a really good job regulating the health and safety standards and regulating all of those sort of structural elements. And now we can sort of think about quality 2.0 and how do we actually take really good science about how children learn in classroom environments and actually in, um, integrate that into policy process. And in, in, in there, we need to focus on where learning occurs. If you go into a classroom, you're automatically typically drawn to where children are excited and engaged and their interactions with children. Um, and so there really are just wonderful opportunities to think about teacher training as a way to improve quality and to maximize our investment. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Uh, our third speaker is uh, uh, another colleague at Northwestern, uh, IPR fellow and associate provost and faculty with DJ Slamsdale. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for having us. So, we're talking about children, what happens when they're young, and what happens when they grow up. And there's someone missing in the presentation so far, and that is the mothers and fathers and grandparents and aunts and uncles and siblings of the children. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now, especially parents. In terms of, so you can see in terms of policy and thinking, how can we change the lives of children facing economic hardship by giving them a head start for early uh, opportunities for learning? But it's in some ways, too much to ask of a small child to be the only change agent in his or her family. That child is coming home if the family is low income to parents who are stressed trying to make ends meet. And parents may not have education themselves or they've had difficult experience in school and they're relying on the early education or the Head Start program uh, for their children. They're very invested in their children. So the first graph shows you this big picture that I'm pointing out, and that is, of all low-income children, this is 200% of the poverty line, about 54% of them have parents who either have a high school degree or less. And so we know that, high, that education is highly related to how children do, their parents' education. And so what I'm proposing in terms of our research program, that I'm doing at Northwestern with my colleagues, including Terry Staple, is what is called a two-generation human capital program. I would also mention, going back to the first slide, that we've been so focused on high school. But with today's global economy and today's emphasis on technology and the skills that you need to have, our country, as Congressman Gould mentioned, uh, is very invested in promoting post-secondary education, whether it's a certificate with meaning in the marketplace, an AA or a BA. Congressman Dole was speaking ahead of time about how important it is to provide financial aid and ways to save, especially for low income families. So, we're calling these two generation human capital programs. It sounds obvious, but they are actually very hard to do and they're rare in the United States. So, we're talking about a new initiative, and the whole idea is to simultaneously link early childhood education with. Um, education for parents and job training at the same time. The other idea, which sounds very obvious, and this was a vision when Head Start 
was launched in 1965. Head Start was a very old family in 1965 and very oriented toward families and communities, also trying to promote parent education. But overall, these decades, Head Start has become much more focused on how children are doing and, of course, provide referrals and supports. But we need to think about how can we get children parents into education job training programs and they exist off in different silos, different funding streams, different locations and communities. And so an average parent is facing different barriers thinking about going to one of these programs. However, if your child is in an early childhood education program, the idea is to focus on the parents coming every day and to recruit them into education and job training. So why is this a good idea? This is a whole theoretical argument, but I'm sure it will make sense to you. You're at the Early Childhood Education Center. You recruit parents into their own programs. What happens is, first of all, they have much higher levels of trust and connection because they're taking their children there every day. They're getting to know the teachers and the administration, and they, sh they share resources. But if the program is done right, where you're training for certificates or degrees, and you're going to school together and you're getting coaching, you build social capital together and you help each other succeed. And a focus group the model program that we're studying, one parent said, you know, when I dropped out of college a couple of years ago, I don't really care, it was just me against the world. But now when I'm late to class, I have 15 people on my phone saying, where are you? So this is the idea of very intensive programs, very much like Perry's preschool, that both Diane Schoenbach and Terry Sable talked about. Here we are today in the 21st century for two gen programs where people were in the 60s and 70s investing in model programs. So then the idea is not only does a child have a wonderful experience and head start or early childhood education, but comes home to parents who, because of their increased education, are able to read more effectively, able to engage in schooling better, have our role models, have higher expectations, and because they're going through education, they feel more likely to navigate their child's education. And of course, this hopefully over the long term leads to better jobs, better income, and stronger child outcomes. The hypothesis, which is truly a hypothesis at this time, there are no evaluation findings yet, is that children will do better in two generation programs than single generation. So it's a very exciting opportunity. So how can we think about this? What do we have in terms of evidence so far? We have the Head Start Impact Study that's been referred to, where children were randomly assigned, 2,000 were randomly assigned to Head Start, and 2,000 could go anywhere in the community. And so it's about 4,000 children, and we know it has mixed findings, a bump up in cognitive development for children one year out. Um, but we haven't asked a question until Terry and I did a study a couple of years ago. How about if your kids randomly assigned to Head Start? Do you get more education? I'm happy to report that the answer is yes. So if you look over for the whole study, 9% more parents whose kids were randomly assigned to Head Start increased their education over a several year period. And then what we did was ask, well, how about different subgroups depending on parent, where parents started? So the green is a separate model. And in fact, if you were a parent with some college and your kid was randomly assigned to start, 23% more parents increased their education during this time period um, from Head Start into uh, kindergarten first grade. Then we also asked about race ethnicity. Is it different by different subgroups? And again, we found that 15% of African American parents increased or increase their um, education to much lower levels. And this, I think, has to do with the huge value that African American parents place on education from long histories of being deprived of education, as well as the fact that Head Start centers, and we found the finding in urban areas, that the finding was there that African Americans have more access in urban areas to Head Start and to education programs for parents. And we also think it may be that since Head Start was launched during the civil rights era, that this is a program that's very welcoming and promotes even more social capital for parents who are African American. So this is business as usual in terms of how uh, Head Start has been functioning. So I find this very encouraging that we actually have 
a randomized uh, experiment of getting random, your kids randomly assigned and actually you increase your education. We don't know why, but we think it's the social capital. It's obviously having your child in a safe place. And also, we, we hypothesize that as you see your own child growing and learning, you might be more motivated to do more on the terms of your own education. So that's business as usual. Now I'd like to talk about the model program that we are studying. It's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where so much is happening in terms of universal pre-K. This is called a Community Action Project, CAP. It is run by a brilliant executive director. It's an anti-poverty agency that's working very hard. It has over 2,000 children enrolled in amazing Head Start programs, which is the yellow, the house, and also um, pre-K. And in 2008, they piloted the whole idea of doing a connected, intensive opportunity for parents, where in the Head Start centers, Parents would be recruited by trusted individuals, teachers, family support staff saying, hey, do you know about Career Advance? Career Advance Healthcare has been offered to parents each year and provides an amazing opportunity. First of all, free tuition to go to community colleges to do what's called stackable training. So you could start at the level of getting a CNA over 16 weeks, move up to LPN and then RN. And you could stay in there, or you could exit and get a job. In addition to tuition, you can see here these career coaches and what I've already mentioned, small peer cohorts. It's just been fantastic. These career coaches meet individually with the parents and also with the groups, so they can brainstorm and problem solve. What's plan A if your car breaks down on the way to the college class in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or public? Transportation is not too great, those types of things. There's wraparound child care as well as financial incentives for staying in school. So we have been studying this. The idea, as I mentioned, is that children in the Career Advance or 2Gen program will do better over time. There may be short-term stresses, as you might imagine. If you can well imagine going to school, working, and raising your child can be initially very stressful and you're spending more time away from your children and you might not see the impacts till later. And then you see positive impacts we hypothesize as your own education goes up and your income becomes more stable. So we're testing short and long-term impacts. But for the time being, we've done one study to look at well, what's happening uh, with these parents as they're in the career advanced program. How well are they doing? So we focused on, I should say, the whole study was at about 200 parents in career advance, 200 parents who are uh, in, whose kids are in Head Start, but they are not in the program. We're using a variety of statistical techniques, propensity score um, techniques, for example, to try to simulate randomized um, experiment, but it's, it's not bad in terms of rigor. But meanwhile, just looking at those who are in the program, and the first 92. What's very exciting, as you can see, is that even if you exited to take a job, a high percentage, 68%, exited with the certificate. And those who stayed and enrolled to go on to the next phase, a very high percent, 81%, got the first certificate to become a certified nursing assistant. And that average is approximately 74%. Our um, hate to uh, make the comparison, but it's the truth in the United States that our community college graduation rate over six years for similar groups is only about 27%. So to be able to achieve a 74% certification in this short of time, we're very excited that the program seems to be getting parents where they want to be, and then we'll, we'll report on child outcomes later. So I'd like to add with um, some quotes from our parents we really believe in learning from parents themselves what they what they wish for their children, how they are experiencing the program, and we're interviewing them, doing focus groups, and this is one parent's comment. Even though my son knows at four years old that he's not stopping his education after high school, he's going to keep going. And he knows that now, and he, he, you know, I think he's going to be much more prepared than I was when I was in high school. And then one last quote. This program has changed my life, it's changed my future, and my family's future. That's the thing. So I think I have so many opportunities for my life. 
So I'm ending here just to say that I've given you insights to what we're doing in terms of designing, studying the implementation of two-generation programs and studying the impacts on parents and children. But it's part of a national momentum, and you can see all the agencies, programs, foundations that are involved in this, uh, including federal and state as well as local. We're particularly appreciative of support from OPRE and ACF and start uh, for our work. But I also point out that there's a relatively new center called SENT uh, at the Aspen Institute. And its sole focus is taking a two-generation approach in programs, policy, media, philanthropy, and research, very broadly defined. And I highly recommend uh, checking out their website as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lindsay, and also thanks to Carrie and Diane for uh, oh, there you are. Excuse me for uh, re really stimulating and uh, and uh, uh, engaging presentations. Um,